Okay, welcome back here to the UN uh, Climate Talks. Uh, we're in Durban, South Africa. We've been bringing you footage from out in the streets all day today. Uh, now we've got uh, with us a, a doctor from Nigeria. His name is Uche Urka Ur Akba. Uh, I always have trouble with that. Urakpa. I have so much trouble with the Nigerian names. Um, tell us a little bit uh, about uh, where you're from and the work you do, first of all. Well, um, I, I'm a doctor and I'm medical director of um, an organization called Doctors for Humankind Foundation based in Abuja, but uh, we're working across Nigeria. And, uh, and, and there are some of um, the groups in, in, in the Niger Delta, especially in Ogoniland, that I'm working very closely with. Um, because Ogoniland is one of those areas where you have so much environmental and human health devastation from, from oil spills and dirty energy exploration generally. This is where all, all the oil rigs are off of the coast of, of Nigeria. Exactly. So the Niger Delta is actually where most of the oil rigs in Nigeria are and, and, and this is the area where these oil companies uh, jettison all the safety standards and, and, and just explore and, and, and devastate and exploit the environment with impunity because they've got so much political clout they don't have to account to the communities where they explore um, oil from so they can just kill everybody and, and nothing matters. So tell us a little bit how does how does the exploration of oil impact people's health? Well, um, uh, just to give um, a few examples, uh, you've you've got some of these oil companies exploring oil in in Ogoni land, and then and then you've got on average one to two oil spills somewhere in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta in Nigeria, every single day. Nigeria has uh, the highest, the single highest uh, frequency of oil spills for any one country the world over. And some of the oil spills that you have in in, in Ogoni land in Nigeria date as far back as 1950 still unremediated, still uncleaned till date. Now what happens with this oil? In fact, most of the oil is actually hydrocarbons, chlorofluorocarbons, which we call greenhouse uh, gases. And so for as long as they are floating on the water and, and across the land, they are emitting greenhouse gases. And what do these greenhouse gases do? They deplete the ozone layer and then they let through more ultraviolet radiation than is acceptable uh, for human health. And what does this increment in ultraviolet, ultraviolet radiation cause? It causes everything from cataracts of the eyes in, in, in children, which is, by the way, very unusual. Cataracts are actually um, uh, um, eye diseases of old age, of diabetes, of degeneration. But in Nigeria and the Niger Delta, you will, you will find children less than 10 years of old, um, 10 years of age, or in their teens with cataracts without any prior history of eye uh, trauma or diabetes or anything of that sort, just from overexposure of the eyes to ultraviolet radiation. That's, by the way, the reason we have sunglasses. But sunglasses are not really fashionable where I come <laughs> from. Okay, so, so their eyes are not protected from ultraviolet radiation. So you have cataracts and you have various degrees of damage to the optic nerve causing various degrees of bli blindness as well. And, and aside from that. Let me just ask you one other thing. We heard earlier today from women who were out uh, in the march outside here in Durban and they were talking about how they felt that climate change and cancer were related. Uh, is that true? Exactly. Now, this is also close to related still to ultraviolet radiation. Now, ultraviolet radiation is known to alter the genome of humans. It is known to, to, to um, facilitate mutations. And we also know that cancers are actually, although we do not know for sure what the actual cause of cancers is, but we know that in common, all cancers have this alteration of the genome in common. So every cancer has a genome that has been altered by one factor or the other. And we know that ultraviolet uh, radiation is one of those factors, actually. So one's, um, one's gene has, for instance, breast cancer. Now, there's a, a gene called the P53 gene. Now, once that gene has been altered, then the person becomes susceptible to breast cancer. And that is why if a mother passes the P53 gene altered or damaged to, to, to her offspring, then her offspring very likely will come down with breast cancer as, as well as other cancers. Now, that as a background now helps one understand why you have an increment in cases of, of, of skin cancer, especially amongst our albinos in the Niger Delta, because their skin lacks uh, melanin and, and is therefore that much more susceptible uh, to, to mutation. So they've got various degrees of sunburn dermatitis and various degrees of cancers of the skin and other kinds of cancers also of, of, of other organs of the body. So there is a clear, there, there is an emerging clear linkage between overexposure uh, to, to ultraviolet radiation and cancers of various forms, not just skin cancers, 
And, and, and this is because of, of what I've explained about the effect of um, ultraviolet radiation on the genome. So that is also why you have something called sunscreens. Sunscreens do not protect just from, from, from a, a sunburn, dermatitis alone. They also protect from, from cancers, uh, especially skin cancers. So, uh, so Uche, um, so we're all going to wear our sunscreen. That's the first step. But what's, what's the longer term step? How can we, uh, how can we, how can we make a change in, the, in this situation? And it's specifically for Nigeria. Nigeria, I think, is a great case in point because it's one of the largest oil producing regions of the world. So it's very dependent on, on the oil industry, on the fossil fuel industry. We've heard a lot here about shifting to renewable energy. Uh, how, what's, what are you seeing in Nigeria? Wouldn't a shift to renewable energy actually hurt the Nigerian people? Fantastic. I'm going to respond to that question, but uh, let me still say a bit more about the health <laughs> damage done by, by oil spills and dirty energy and, and, and climate change. Now you've got an increment in, in other morbidities and mortalities related to, to climate change. You've got uh, birth deformities, you know, so a much more uh, incidence and prevalence of birth deformities than in the general population. So children, are, more and more children are coming out with problems. And you've got miscarriages, uh, first trimester miscarriages. You've got early menopause. I mean, ch uh, women in their early 30s hitting menopause because of the effect of these chemicals. So all this is the ovaries. Yeah. All this is a result of yeah. the exposure to the oil that's yeah, been spilled exactly. in, the, in the area where they live. Now, now, according to a UNEP report, United Nations Environmental Program report, in some parts of the Niger Delta, groundwater well water has benzene levels uh, more than 900 times acceptable limits and we know benzene is a, is a well-known cancer causing agent the world over other chemicals like toluene toluene is a well-known cause of, of birth deformities it's it's a well-known teratogen it's it's there in huge amounts because of the oil spills and, and 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 greenhouse gases in the environment and naphthalene also so there is a long list of these chemicals that impact human health that the oil uh, companies are spilling over onto the environment and abandoning uh, amongst the people. Now, now, in response to your question as to what ought to be done, yes, the path forward is for us here to come up with some convention, some international mechanism to improve upon and replace the Kyoto Protocol. That's number one. 2020 is too far away. We cannot wait till 2020 to come up with an international mechanism to, to, to move us away from dirty energy towards green energy. Why do we need an international mechanism? Well, because most of the problems of climate change are at once both local and global, international. And oil spill in Ogoniland, emitting greenhouse gases for years, can be responsible for the more violent uh, twisters that we're having in America, for the flooding, for the tsunami in Japan, and, and other places. So the earth is a closed system. Now local interventions will not solve the problem. We need an international mechanism. We need to understand that we're all in this together. And, and here on earth, all of humankind are like the human body. All parts of the human body are inter interconnected. If, if something happens, something bad happens to the foot, it affects the brain, it affects the head, it affects all parts of the body. So we cannot say, well, let's go about solving this climate problem on an individual country by country basis. There has to be a platform for the whole world to come together and come to a more effective solution. But at the same time, on the local level, people should be doing what they can <clears throat> to move away from dirty energy. Uh, there, there are groups in, in America that are shutting down coal uh, plants, coal power plants, and preventing the American government from coming up with new uh, coal power plants because of all the problems that uh, we, we all know uh, are derived from, from, from dirty energy, from, from coal powered plants. Uh, a coal plant, for instance, will emit, uh, will produce tons of mercury every year. And we know what mercury does. It damages the nervous system. It damages development. You produce idiots, people with, um, with IQ levels below 20, below 30, because of mercury embedded in their nervous system, a developing nervous system, and sulfur dioxide. These are all chemicals also that come from, from coal plants. By the way, the Nigerian government um, convinced by Chinese companies is planning on building a whole new rash of coal power plants and these are some of the things that we're, we're here to fight against. Now if there is an international mechanism to prevent that and to move nations towards clean energy, towards hydropower, uh, um, solar power and so on and so forth, then people will start realizing how, by the way, people don't build in the health co-benefits of, 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 um, of, of new green energy into the cost, the so-called cost of green energy, which is why they say, um, you know, um, dirty energy is cheaper. It is not cheaper. If you build in the health costs 
the cancers, the leukemias, the birth deformities, and if you build all that health cost, all that burden on the health system into the cost of dirty energy, then you find that dirty energy is not even cheap at all. So, Uchi, you've been following the talks here. You've been here in Durban now, uh, where these talks are going on. What's your impression of, uh, of the, the people inside the rooms there who are making the deals? Are they, are they listening? Are they paying attention to, the, to these factors? That, that is a sad part. We, we were in a meeting this morning showing that on current greenhouse gas emission levels, we're actually on a six degree temperature rise path rather than a two degree temperature rise path. Now, those who understand the implications of, of, of that for the environment, I mean, we, we, we're having the problems we're having now because of a, of a temperature rise level that is less than two degrees. Now imagine what happens when we attain six degrees, which is where we're headed right now. Instead of the greenhouse gases coming down, there's an organization, by the way, called 350.org, seeking to bring uh, uh, carbon dioxide emission levels down to 350 parts per million. Now we're, we're actually moving, shooting upwards towards 400 parts per million. And here we, we're dithering, we're bickering about international interests. People are here trying to scuttle the, the, the talks, scuttle the Kyoto Protocol, and leave us in limbo from now till 2020 so that they can build so much dirty energy plants across the globe. Now, that is what is going on here in Durban. Uh, the, people, the negotiators are not listening to civil society. They're not listening to the voices of people. They're here pursuing corporate interests, corporate capitalistic interests, which, which insist on, on funding dirty energy because according to them, dirty energy appears to be cheaper. Without realizing, some of them even think that, okay, by the time uh, the Armageddon of, of what they're doing now comes, they would be long dead, and so it wouldn't be their problem. But what kind of a future are we bequeathing our children? What kind of people are we if we think that because the consequences will come after we're long dead, then, then it doesn't matter what we do now. What kind of people are we? So, so we're hoping and appealing that nations will come away from selfish interests, think about the wider global interests, and come to an agreement. But, but we're pessimistic that that will happen because of the, of the feelers that we're getting um, from, from, from the negotiations. Great. I think um, after, uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to bring you uh, an interview with uh, someone from Via Campesina, which is a, land, uh, the, uh, a rural people's movement around the world. Uh, and they talk a lot about the impact of corporations and how corporations are, are having such a, a massive uh, impact on governments and governments' activities. And it's really taking away their right to grow the food they want and to, and to act the way they want. So it'll be really interesting to compare what you're saying about corporations in Nigeria uh, with this, this, uh, this interview that we shot earlier today with Via Campesina in Haiti. Uh, but just one last question about Nigeria. Uh, how, what do you feel will be the impact on Nigeria and the people of Nigeria if there's no agreement next at the end of next week here? Well, um, we're actually preparing for that scenario already because we suspect that there will be no agreement. It will fall to civil society to, to create a groundswell of, of resistance to dirty energy in Nigeria. And so that's why we're tackling this on the global a platform which is the, 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 the COP conferences and by the way that's another heart-rending thing about it this is COP 17 and, and, and it speaks to to our inability to agree as humankind how come how do we need 17 such conferences to come to an agreement and yet we're not getting there we're not you know why do we need even more than one COP to come to an, to an agreement. Imagine the amount of resources we spend to, conv to convene and converge every year. We've done that 17 times and we're not even closer than we were at the beginning to reaching a binding agreement. Okay, so it, 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 it's a painful thing, but if we come away from Durban with nothing, then we go home and, and, and talk to the people and, and educate them about the negative consequences of climate change and about who is responsible. And then the people armed with this knowledge will be able to resist new oil uh, uh, wells, resist new coal plants and move possibly on family by family basis in the direction of, of, of green energy. The good thing about green energy is that you can decentralize. People can have little solar panels on their own individual roofs and provide their own needs and it will spread. That, that, that is the part that we are hopeful 
and optimistic about that on a family by family, community by community basis, the people will rise against dirty energy because they see, they live in the midst of the consequences of dirty energy. Great. Well, thank you for that really, really interesting insight into the situation on the ground in Nigeria right now, Uche. Uh, so now we're going to bring you that, uh, that video we shot earlier today on the streets of Durban uh, with, a, with a, a man from Haiti who's the executive director of the, the Via Campesina organization, uh, or a, a partner organization of Via Campesina in Haiti.